Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 32 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Russian woodpecker. And no, I don't mean a bird. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Hey there, Dom. So in 1976, a mysterious radio signal began to be transmitted, uh, and it was so powerful that it interfered with radio communications over much of the Earth, uh, that, which it had, takes incredible power to do that. And eventually the signal was traced to a secret location in the Soviet Union. And pulsing 10 times a second, it made a sound like a woodpecker pecking on a tree. So it became known as the Russian woodpecker. Uh, and it, this broadcast continued until the Cold War started to wind down in 1989. So what was the Russian woodpecker? And what was the Soviet Union trying to do with it? That's what we'll be discussing today on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what was the Russian woodpecker? Well, as you said, it was an incredibly powerful radio signal that usually, not always, but usually pulsed at around 10 hertz. A hertz is a measure of frequency or how often something recurs. So like one hertz Something has a frequency of one hertz if it happens one times a second. So the woodpecker normally played at 10 hertz, so it would pulse 10 times a second. And on the radio, it sounded like this. Okay. Okay. So that's what it sounded like. So there was like the, the pecking, and then it's sort of a thumping underneath. Was this what they call like we've heard of numbers stations? Was this a numbers station? No. Um, for one thing, it was not as it was way more powerful than a typical numbers station. And by the way, we'll be doing a future episode before people ask, as they already have. <laughs> yes, we will be doing a future episode on numbers stations. Um, what this though, even aside from the power issue. Uh, this didn't transmit numbers. On a number station, you'll like hear an electronic voice saying things like 23, X, 35, 9, M, 12, stuff like that. Okay. And there's a question of who's operating these things and why are they operating. And we'll talk all about that in the future. But this signal was too regular and just did not have that kind of information encoded in it. There so was it no, wasn't a, no it voice. wasn't a number station. Yeah. yeah. There was no voice and there was nothing similar in terms of the structure of the signal. It didn't have like an alphanumeric code embedded in it. So how did people uh, react when the this number, when this uh, woodpecker started transmitting? Oh, people hated it. I mean, you can imagine what it would be like to t hear this thing going while you're trying to do your own radio broadcast. And it would just be incredibly maddening. It interfered with communications across the globe. <laughs> what was that again? <laughs> well, I was saying people hated it. I mean, you could imagine what it would be like trying to do your own radio broadcast. And this thing is pecking on the same frequency as you're trying to talk and people are trying to listen. It interfered with communications across the globe. So uh, people just absolutely hated it. So it was on a particular frequency. I just wanted to, to clear that one. Up. Yeah. Is it one frequency. T typically 10 hertz, although it, it changed a little bit. And it interfered with with broadcast, you know, regular commercial broadcasts. It interfered with ham radio. It interfered with aviation communications, you know, between airplanes and ground stations. And there were just thousands of complaints worldwide about this. And so the ham community in particular started to work to try to figure out what was going on. So what's the ham community? Well, Ham is it's a it's slang for amateur radio. So ham radio, amateur radio is the same thing. Ba it still exists, but it, I I think it I it may have been more popular a few decades ago than it is now. I know um, back in the seventies, 
Uh, my father was an engineer. He was an engineering professor. He knew lots of other engineering professors. And this was kind of a thing that engineers often did. You know, they build like a private radio tower in their backyard and do amateur radio. Um, and so you had a lot of involvement by engineers pre-internet um, rather than computer programmers uh, because the engineers had the skills to build the tower. And at the time, you had to learn Morse code. Um, and I remember qualifying. Uh, I wasn't very good at it, and I didn't have much opportunity to practice it. But I qualified early on as a ham operator, and I could do Morse code. At the, uh, you had to achieve a certain level of proficiency before you with Morse before you were allowed to progress to voice communication. But uh, a lot of people, I wasn't one of them, but a lot of people did progress. They got good enough with Morse that then they got a license that would let them do voice communication over the radio. And it was used to connect uh, widespread, you know, widely flung parts of the world before we had the Internet. And it was way too expensive or otherwise problematic to just call people on the telephone at great distances. So you'd have ham operators saying, here's what's going on in my area. You'd have communications with people behind the Iron Curtain. Hams would help cooperate uh, relief efforts if there was a natural disaster, all kinds of stuff like that, as well as just being hobbyists who did it for the fun. It's like having a pen pal in a distant part of the world. Right, right. And and so then the ham community got involved trying to yeah. figure out what this is. Yeah. And by, you know, triangulating signal strength and stuff, they figured out it was coming from somewhere in the USSR. Specifically, it was coming, and that's why it's called the Russian woodpecker. Right. Specifically, it was being transmitted from a couple of sites in Ukraine and in Siberia. And it was hard for the amateurs to pin down exactly where it was, but they had a general idea. And because they hated it so much, they formed what was called the Russian Woodpecker Hunting Club. <laughs> and and the idea was there, just like uh, the Russian Woodpecker was jamming their transmissions, they said, we're going to jam it. Oh, wow. And so that was how they hunted the Russian Woodpecker was by setting up signals to jam whatever the Soviets were trying to do with the Woodpecker. Now, it certainly uh, had to be interested in this beyond the ham community. What did the Western countries' intelligence uh, community, uh, what, what what was their uh, uh, response to this? Yeah, so they were obviously interested in this. Uh, we We really didn't know much about what they were able to find out about it. Now, obviously, they have spy networks that the hams don't that would enable them to learn more. But we didn't really learn much about that until after the Cold War, because during the Cold War, they didn't publicly announce the results of their investigation into the woodpecker. We do know that they were interested in it, and they referred to it under a different set of code names. They'd call it things like Steelwork or Steelyard. Mm. Um, so they had their own terminology for it. And eventually, after the Cold War, uh, we got a, an idea of what it, a very firm idea of exactly what it was. But at the time, there were a bunch of different theories. What were the what were the various theories about what the Russian woodpecker was from from that time? Well, because it was so effective at jamming other people's communications, that was an obvious first theory. Maybe it's there to just jam broadcasts. Maybe they're just messing with us. Um, and so it's it's all just about interfering with Western communications. Another thought, because it was so low frequency, I mean, 10 hertz, that 10 pulses a second, that's very low frequency. Mm -hmm. And so they thought maybe it has to do with communicating with submarines, because right. one of the things about submarines is the water, the salt water is not penetrated well by high frequency radio communications we normally use. And so in, in, instead, extremely low frequency or ELF communications in the three to 30 hertz range are useful for communicating with submarines. Another thought is maybe this is some kind of weather control experiment that the Soviets are doing. And another kind of similar exotic theory about what it might be is maybe it's mind control. Maybe this is a mind control experiment. And uh, there's a, a clip, and this will be in a documentary that I'll have a link to in the show notes. Uh, but there's a clip from 1981 of David Brinkley, the NBC commentator, who was doing a commentary back then uh, about the USSR bombarding the UF, 
the U.S. with extremely low frequency uh, transmissions. And he said, you know, they've tried to influence be hu human behavior with electronic signals. And he said, quote, are they trying to reduce us to a zombie to a zombie stumbling and groping around and waiting to be told what to do? So, <laughs> so, uh, so that was one of the. I can hear that in David Brinkley's voice. That's something he would say. Yes, that's uh, that's that's very David Brinkley. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so there were people wondering: is are this is some kind of biohacking that the Soviets were trying to do? Mm. Uh, and then there was another theory that was uh, not as out there that said basically this is an over the horizon radar. Um, what an over the horizon radar is normally when you see a radar image, it's just looking at things that are in its own vicinity out to the horizon, but it doesn't have the ability. Most radars don't to peek over the horizon in order to achieve that. What you have to do is bounce the radar signal off the ionosphere so that it's not blocked by the curvature of the earth. Instead, it'll go up, hit the ionosphere at an angle, bounce down again, reflect off of stuff, and bounce back up the off the ionosphere back to the receiver. And so that's how you use a radar to look over the horizon. And that was the kind of final proposal about what the woodpecker was, that it was an over-the-horizon radar. Okay, so we have the, the, claims, the, the claims of what it might have been. What, uh, from a recent perspective, what can we say about the, the Russian woodpecker? Well, uh, Pretty quickly, they eliminated the broadcast jamming theory because this was actually interfering with Radio Moscow. So it's like, why would they be interfering with their own communications? Um, also, submarine communication got eliminated because even though the woodpecker was in the right frequency range to be ELF subcommunications, um, it the signal didn't carry enough data. You need to actually be saying something to the submarines, and and they weren't. It was just a repetitive signal. Um, the weather control theory didn't have any real support. There was no evidence that what, that's what was happening. Neither was the mind control theory. But the overall, the over the horizon radar theory was well supported. Um, a lot of the hams picked up on this because being a lot of engineer, a lot of them being engineers, they knew about how radar worked, a lot of them. And so they said, yeah, this thing is structured like a radar signal. And the, placement of the different facilities that they could tell it was coming from indicated like this is trying to get more global radar coverage by placing them in different areas. It, like the placement looks designed to spread the coverage of this thing, of this radar signal. So, so that was pretty much what the ham community concluded was likely going on. And so with the end of the Cold War, lots of uh, lots of these secrets got revealed and we found out about a lot of things that was going on behind the Iron Curtain. What did we find out about the Russian woodpecker after that? Well, uh, one thing we learned is what it, what they called it, because Russian woodpecker was just our name for the thing because it was a classified program. They called it the Duga radar. And as the name indicates, it's radar. We also learned the exact sites and you can actually go to them today. If you do that, you'll see a huge structure. I mean, this thing is like hundreds of feet tall. It looks, it's these just arrays, rectangular arrays of towers that are netted together in a way. It kind of looks like a huge set of box springs on its side. I mean, it looks a little bit like that. It's, it's so big that the transmitter and the receiver were 40 miles apart. And wow. um, it, the receiver turns out to be located in what was the closed military town known as Chernobyl 2. And Chernobyl II. that Chernobyl yeah. connection is going to come back. Um, oh, okay. So it's right there next to the the receiver is near the it was within sight of the Chernobyl nuclear plant. So what's going on with the Russian woodpecker today? Well, it's, it's, well, the, its the, main broadcast shut down in 1989, but there has been a recurrence in very recent, just the last few years of a similar signal that's now called the container radar, which is located in Russia rather than the Ukraine, because Ukraine is now an independent nation. Um, and it uses a new generation of over the horizon radar. So they've improved that. There's also less need for over the horizon radar now because we have satellite networks that provide a lot of the coverage. Um, the basic purpose, as we'll get to with the Russian woodpecker, was it was looking for American missile launches. 
And you want to look over the horizon to see those, because if you wait till the missiles come over the horizon, you have no time to respond. Uh, but now we have satellites that can detect middle, missile launches, and so there's not as much need for this. Um, you can actually go to visit the uh, the receiver for the uh, for the Duga radar or the Russian woodpecker. It's located in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is a radioactive area that you're not allowed to live in. You can't stay there, but it's it's it the level of radiation is low enough that you can make brief visits there. And so you can go on a tour of the of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. You can buy your ticket. You can go in. You can walk around, look at the desolation. There have been people who will like climb up on the on the on the Russian woodpecker radio towers. They've got all kinds of pictures of it on the internet. Videos people have taken. Um, and so now it's uh, it's a well known site. We know exactly what it was doing, and uh, you can go visit it if you want. <laughs> So is that it? Is that is that uh, our our mystery wrapped up uh, quicker than usual yeah, this week? Well, it, it would be, and this would be our shortest podcast to date, except there's a big twist. And mm. the big twist involves Chernobyl, which, as we said, is located right there next to the receiver. Um, so in 2015, a documentary called The Russian Woodpecker came out, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, the video features a performance artist from Kiev named Fedor Alexandrovich. And he's he's an interesting character. Being a performance artist is interesting enough, uh, <laughs> but it, there's more. Um, his mom, who is interviewed in it, talks about he was a pacifist as a child during the Cold War. And he went out and like gathered, tried to gather peace signatures on petitions from other children. So they naturally beat him up. Um, and, uh, he was there, uh, when in Kiev, which is near Chernobyl in 1986, when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster happened. And so he himself was evacuated and placed in an orphanage temporarily. Uh, he had strontium, he has strontium in his bones as a result of uh, the Chernobyl accident. And as a result, he's had some health problems. Um, but he's a young man. He's a father. And he's kind of an eccentric, um, which, again, goes along with being a performance artist. Um, he's the kind of guy who makes art films where he will get naked, except wrapping himself in plastic wrap and walking through a radioactive site carrying a torch to make a statement. Um, so he does that in the Russian Woodpecker documentary. Um, he also, in the documentary, interviews a bunch of people uh, including the former commander of the of the Russian woodpecker of the Duga Duga radi radar facility, he talks to a radar expert. He talks to one of the guys who designed the facility. Uh, he talks to the guy who invest who headed the investigation of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. He talks to the guy who was in charge of the Atomic Energy Commission in Russia, and they have some very interesting things to say. Okay, so what does the the Duga and Chernobyl have to do with each other? Well, one of the things they talk about is how uh, the Russian officials he interviews talk about is how Americans were able to put radar really close to the Soviet Union because we have allies near there. We have Turkey, you know, which is part of NATO. And so during the Cold War, we'd have listening posts right there in Turkey monitoring what's happening in the Soviet Union. But it was much harder for the Russians to detect what's happening in America because of the got the whole earth in between us. And so that's why they needed, and they didn't have the big satellite networks then. So that's why they built this. They had to compensate for their distance by building really huge listening stations that could see, see over the horizon. Um, so they, they started work with the woodpecker in, uh, in 76. And then within 10 years, um, they were detecting like America. They said they could detect every American space shuttle launch. So that gave them good assurance they would be able to detect our missile launches. Uh, they uh, there were nine major uh, missile U.S. missile bases that they were watching, and they uh, had uh, a uh, develop. They'd gotten it developed enough. They would have about twenty five minutes warning if we launched 
to make some kind of decision about what they were going to do. They would have 25 minutes notice. So they could contact the Kremlin and say, activate the perimeter system, which we've also the secret <laughs> Russian doomsday system that we've also talked about in a previous episode of right. Mysterious World. And and they wanted us, they actually wanted us to know about this because they wanted us to know that we could see these missile launches so we would be deterred, that they could see our missile launches so that we would be deterred from thinking we could launch and not have them retaliate. Okay. So actually, even though they didn't publicly announce it, they knew American experts are going to know this is an over-the-horizon radar, and we want them to know that. So they didn't really want, though, to interfere with normal communications. You know, they learned that their signal was interfering, like with SOS signals, so people were being endangered by this. And they actually tried changing the frequency so that they wouldn't interfere. Uh, with other needed important signals. Um, but they, when they did that, they couldn't overcome the Northern Lights, which also have a, have a radio dimension to them. And so they were competing with the Northern Lights, and that kind of boxed them in in terms of the frequencies they could use for this radar. Uh, also, this was an extremely expensive project. It cost like twice as much as the Chernobyl reactor did. Um, the figure that's given in the documentary is it costs seven billion rubles, which it, I mean, seven billion dollars doesn't sound huge for a government thing in America. But in the Cold War, in economically underdeveloped Russia, I mean, I remember when the Cold War ended, Gorbachev said in order to just catch up with Portugal, we're going to have to work for 14 years on our economy. Right. So seven billion rubles. This was a big amount. Uh, the commander of the woodpecker says that they never actually went into combat mode with this thing. They had been working on the system and refining it, um, and they were going to make some final revisions to the engineering and stuff, and then go put it on combat alert status in September of 1986. But in April of 1986, the Chernobyl accident happened, and they were told to stand down. So they never implemented the final things and never put it on official combat duty, um, although it did continue broadcasting until 1989, three years later. We keep mentioning the Chernobyl uh, incident. For listeners who may not be very familiar with it, what caused the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant? Basically, they were running a test. The reactor had been under some strain, and they had an order from like their central planning agency to test it in a certain kind of situation. And they did this at night. And so the night crew is there. And there's one guy who's in charge because he has the most experience with nuclear stuff, but he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And he orders a power down and restart test. And this can be tricky in the kind of nuclear reactor that Chernobyl is or was. Um, it basically, the power plant entered what's called the iodine valley or the iodine pit, which is a particular um, phase of operations that it's very difficult to recover from. And so uh, once that happened, things started cascading out of control. You had a hydrogen buildup, which then ignited and blew the roof off the power plant and spread radioactive stuff all over the place. Um, there's a fascinating account of this. I'll get it a link to it in our show notes, and we'll talk about it more in a future episode. Uh, but there's a book by an American nuclear engineer named James Mahaffey who, called Nuclear um, uh, Nuclear Accidents, or Atomic Accidents, um, that has a fascinating account of exactly what happened with uh, Chernobyl and other events. And he's a marvelous writer. Uh, he has he has a real gift for making it interesting and 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 fun if that's possible to read, because uh, you sense it's kind of like a, a black comedy. You know, you know, because of the topic of the book, you're headed towards something is going to go wrong here. And you're just watching these guys inch closer to something really stupid happening. Um, <laughs> but um, but in any event, that's basically what happened with Chernobyl. They at the night crew did this power down and restart test. It went into the iodine valley and they couldn't recover. Meanwhile, we we have this film, this Rus Russian woodpecker film yeah. documentary and, from 2015. And it has this really Cold War paranoia vibe, even though it came out in like 2015. 
it's really clear that for the performance artist it features Fedor Alexandrovich that um he the the Soviet Union really haunts this guy and i mean he's still like he was a peace activist as a child he is still a peace activist he is like all against he's also ukrainian there's been lots of tensions between ukraine and russia lately um and he is he's really concerned that the soviets want to rebuild the ussr and launch world war 3 and so there's this big cold war vibe in the in the documentary it uses lots of hidden camera footage because even now, after the Soviet Union has been gone for all this time, a lot of the a lot of the interviewees don't want to talk on camera. And so he even he not just keeps their faces blurred in some situations or doesn't name them. He actually uses hidden camera footage. There's one scene where one of his associates gets one of them drinking and uses a hidden camera on it. So you have positively unwilling interviewees being, you know, taped without their knowledge. Um, during the course of the film, uh, Fedor's parents start to fear for his life, uh, because of, you know, what's happening with the documentary. Fedor himself starts to fear for his son's life. And at one part, uh, there, he, after he makes a very dramatic claim about the radar and he becomes very scared, he says, okay, we're not pursuing this anymore. And the documentary still like takes a different direction, uh, partially. The filmmakers pull it back onto the same subject a little bit, but Fedor at one point at least says, I'm done with this. This is too dangerous. We're not doing this anymore. So what was this dramatic claim that uh, made him want to stop? Well, basically, um, he says he, he talks to some of the experts who say that basically the, the woodpecker didn't work as well as it should have. And that was a problem, according to Alexandrovich, because of how much it cost. Uh, he claims that there was a death penalty, in effect, for wasting government funds at the time. And so, according to him, this is his theory, um, the Soviet Minister of Communications, Vasily Shamshin, uh, who was in office in the 1980s, he, was, he held the post of Minister of Communications from 1980 to 1989. He's now dead. He died in 2009. Uh, but according to him, Vasily Shamshin, who was over this project and had advocated it early on, would have potentially, along with the designers of the Russian woodpecker, would have been in big trouble and possibly subject even to the death penalty for wasting government funds on this project that didn't work as it was supposed to. And according to Androvich's claim, Alexandrovich's claim, uh, Shamshin then pressured the Chernobyl engineers into performing a dangerous test on the nuclear power plant at a dangerous time, knowing that it would likely lead to disaster, and that thus they would ruin the area in which the radar receiver was located, and thus be able to hide the failure of the radar system by blaming it on the nuclear power plant accident. So basically, you cause the worst nuclear accident in history to hide the failure of the radar and save the radar's designers and the officials over them in the Soviet structure. That's that's the big claim. Yeah, it seems like an excessive <laughs> uh, method to hide your yeah, failure. But, but yeah. you know, paranoid <laughs> times lead to paranoid actions. So... So that's the right, claim. Right. Yep. And he and he interviews um the a bunch of people about and asks them about this claim. And it it really comes down to a key phone call between the head of the Atomic Energy Commission and the engineers at the plant. And did this phone call happen and what was said in it if if it did occur? How did the people that Fido interviewed react to this claim? Well, when he's interviewing uh, the Chernobyl, the engineer from Chernobyl, um, he says it's fantastical and no, this did not happen. When he interviews the commander of the Duga radar, uh, he says it's BS, only he doesn't just say the initials B and S. <laughs> he says the full thing in Russian. Yeah. And he also says it's malarkey and it's, uh, it's fantasies. Um, but... When he talks to the guy who headed the investigation into the nuclear accident, he says 
um, that the head of the Atomic Energy Commission insisted that they proceed with the experiment despite it having this suicidal nature because the reactor was unstable after having been pushed for a day. Um, so the investigator gives some credibility here. Uh, he says that uh, the head of atomic energy insisted they do this suicidal experiment with the reactor in a phone call um, to the shift supervisor on the night shift. He says that he'd actually called the day shift and they refused to do it because they knew how dangerous it, as dangerous it was. But the night shift agreed. Um, and the investigator says he's heard the tape of the uh, of the ato- head of atomic energy telling the guys this. Interesting. Which, you know, given that the head of the atomic energy uh, agency uh, would be complicit in in the crime, uh, it's not not, un- it's not it's not unexpected that he would deny it. I suppose. No, and in fact, he does deny it. Um, he's also interviewed in this and he says that there is no such call that he did call the plant after the accident. And his voice is, you know, like it appears on tr- in transcripts. He's shown speaking in transcripts after the accident occurred, but he denies that there was any such phone call prior to the accident. Um, he also says that the investigator who was charged to look into this is an, in the translation, a quote, odious and dirty person. He also bizarrely seems at one point to say there was no such person as Vasily Shamshin, even though his existence is a matter of public record. So I don't know what's up with that. Is that seems like a bizarre claim. I wonder if there's any translation issue or, or what that might mean. I don't know what to make of that. Um, Another expert that they talked to says the tapes have been falsified and the key documents are still classified. So what do you so this is very an interesting turn that this episode has taken. So what do you make of this theory then? Well, we basically have a he said, he said situation where you've got the the head investigator and the head of atomic energy flatly contradicting each other. Um, the, uh, the artist, uh, Fedor doesn't claim to be able to resolve this. He admits he's, he's not qualified in this area. And this is only quote, a theory, close quote. Um, I found myself wondering how much of this is a performance on his part, because he's a performance artist. They do bizarre pranky stuff sometimes. And so I'm I'm wondering partly how much does he even believe this theory? Um, and there's this moment, like I mentioned, where he says, OK, I think I'm afraid my son is in danger. We're not going to do this anymore. And at that point, like the other filmmakers are going, dude, you have totally sold out. <laughs> you know, you have you've, you're a total sellout now, even though they would previously been praising him as a brave genius. Well, part of me wants to know. How much of this is just a performance? You know, I, I, I mean, he, the, the people he interviews, I assume they're telling the truth from their perspective. I mean, they're the actual officials. Um, but uh, and the but the only one who gives a strong confirmation is the is the investigator after the accident. Everybody else denies pretty much, um, at least the people who had direct knowledge of the situation. So um, I I find myself wondering, okay, so if you know this radar is not functioning the way it should, surely there are better ways to do this earlier on than mere months before it's scheduled to go into battle mode. Um, you know, you could. There are all kinds of you could if you're an administrator and this you learn this, you could set up a fall guy much earlier than that. Um, <laughs> right. So it's kind of a last minute thing if, you know, in terms of we're going to blow the station just months before this is scheduled to really be used in a big way or the way it's meant to be. Um, Also, they didn't shut it down completely in 1986. They continued to use it until 1989, three, three more years, suggesting it was working well enough that uh, that they saw value in it until the Cold War began to wind down. I mean. Maybe it didn't detect, you know, the beating of a gnat's wing the way they wanted it to, but they saw value in keeping this thing running. So how bad could its operations have been? Um, 
So ultimately, I think that the claim that uh, Fedor makes in the documentary is improbable, but um, you know, I can't I can't rule it out. Period. Because in paranoid times, people do paranoid things. So we always approach things from a, a faith and reason perspective. That was the reason perspective. Is there a faith perspective on this story? Not so much. Um, one thing that's nice, though, about watching the documentary is, you know, Our Lady of Fatima said Russia would be converted. And in talking to the Russian and Ukrainian officials in this documentary, even though communism was the atheistic communism was the, was the official ideology of this region just a few decades ago. Wow, they've got tons of icons and religious symbols <laughs> in their offices. Yeah. So even former communist officials just have icons all over the place. So however imperfect the conversion, it's nice to see it. <laughs> That's good. Um, and also, there right now, things are really tense politically between Russia and Ukraine. But also, there's a really tense conflict in the religious world um, between the Russian Orthodox Church and <clears throat> and, uh, and the and various Ukrainian Orthodox bodies that have been seeking to 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 uh, unite and form a single autocephalous, that means self-headed, right? Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which the Patriarch of Constantinople has recognized, but the Russian Orthodox have not recognized, and so there's a schism right now. And I'd encourage everybody to pray for that, just because it involves these same group of believers, even though it doesn't have anything to do with the Duga radar. Right, right. That's always good to, to pray for these conflicts. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the Russian woodpecker mystery? What do you, what do you say? So it was an over-the-horizon radar. It was a mysterious relic of the Cold War that's really creepy to look at, and I'm sure it would be creepy to go visit, but it probably was not the cause of the Chernobyl accident. And folks, you've probably seen, I'm got, I think I'm going to use an image of the Duga radar on the uh, the, the, yeah. the show's uh, artwork for, for this, but uh, so uh, you, you, you'll get to see a picture of that there, but uh, you can find it read, pretty readily online. So, Jimmy, what, what resources do we have for folks on this? Well, one thing is a uh, the Wikipedia article on the Russian woodpecker, and it's got some photos there. Another is the Russian woodpecker documentary that I've been talking about. Um, there's also an article from Newsweek uh, on different conspiracies, including uh, this one, that uh, the Chernobyl disaster was a cover-your-butt thing for the failure of the Duga radar. And then I'll also have a link to uh, James Mahaffey's excellent book, Atomic Accidents. All right. So that's the, the Russian woodpecker. Um, let's move on to our mysterious feedback. Uh, we've got some feedback on our Jimmy Hoffa episode, episode that we did. Francis Lee uh, writes on YouTube, all right, at first I thought the ghosts and pyramid topics were coincidental, but then you do the scrolls and the birth of Christ, Dyatlov Pass, and now Jimmy Hoffa, this blows my mind because not even a week ago, I started watching documentaries on him randomly. Just last night, my dad and I had a long conversation about him. My mom's side of the family is Sicilian, so we joke around a bit about the mafia. I can't believe every topic that I personally take interest in and start researching at that time. A podcast comes out either that week or soon after. I mean, do you have a line on what Francis Lee is uh, doing yeah, here? <laughs> well, I have something similar. I have often noticed that I'm thinking about some obscure thing. I haven't heard about it from anybody else. I'll just be thinking about it on my own. And then very shortly thereafter, I'll get asked a question about it on Catholic Answers Live. It's like my guardian angel or God is preparing me for hearing about this or for needing to interact with this in a bigger way. So I, I even keep a, a log. I uh, st recently started keeping a log of these incidents that maybe in the future I can I can do some mathematical analysis. If I can figure out how to compare it to the null hypothesis, I could say, is there anything statistically significant here or not? Um, but um, I don't know. Same thing, whether by chance or by providence, the same thing happens to other people in one way or another. Mm. Maybe it's collapsing probabilities in a multiverse. <laughs> uh, William Geist writes on YouTube I, I wasn't initially interested that interested in the topic of Jimmy Hoffa after listening to the show I was intrigued and thoroughly entertained thanks thank you very much William um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to the episode even though it's kind of an interesting uh, balance in prepping for the show because if I made every episode something people have heard of we'd run out of episodes pretty fast and we also wouldn't cover some really interesting stuff. 
because some of the lesser known things are some of the most interesting. So my commitment to the listener is I'm going to tell you something really interesting every time out, even if you've never heard of it before. So if you haven't heard of it and it looks kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I'd be interested in this, try listening anyway, because I'm if it's something you're kind of wondering about, I'm going to try to have something really interesting there under the surface, even if you hadn't ever heard of it before. Yeah, I as 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 a co-host of this with you, Jimmy, I'm the same way. Uh, so I've, some of these I've never heard of. And then we talk about it. I'm like, I, this is fascinating. <laughs> I get really yeah. into it. So awesome. Uh, let's see. Jonathan on Facebook writes, as someone from Michigan, I was excited to see this episode on Jimmy Hoffa because it's talked about here and there relatively often. I was hoping that there'd be some mention of some of the more recent investigations to find his body. For example, they searched a barn not far from my parents' home looking for his remains. Yeah, um, I I wanted and I did discuss those at least briefly in a kind of general way, saying they've looked at the different reported body locations recently and so far they haven't found anything. Um, I I didn't want to go through those in detail. Because it would have, oh, they looked here, they dug up this place, and it wasn't there, and then they dug up this place, and it wasn't there. Um, but I, but those are discussed in greater detail in Wikipedia's Jimmy Hoffa article. So, uh, so I, we linked to that, and I figured people could look there for more detail on the specifics because it has been a source of ongoing interest, and they have been digging up different locations, uh, looking at reported sites of where he was buried. But as we mentioned in the uh, in the episode itself, the apparent assassin, Frank the Irishman Sheeran, was told that the body was cremated. And so that's why it hasn't been found. Right. OK, so and then Joseph on Facebook writes uh, about Jimmy Hoffa. He probably got himself lost up at the Outlaw Pass. Well, yep. that's stranger things have happened. <laughs> yep. If you listen to this show, you know they have. <laughs> so, Jimmy, uh, that's our feedback. How about some mysterious headlines? Okay, so I have a couple of things. Um, both of them are sciency this time. One of them is about an atmospheric phenomenon named Steve. Uh, <laughs> Steve stands for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement, and it's a term that's been used to an, to refer to a new kind of northern lights phenomenon. It is not the same as normal northern lights. Um, one of the things about Steve is it appears dominantly purple with some green highlights, little green accentuations, I suppose, which is neat for me because as a kid, the colors of my elementary school were purple and with green highlights. So uh, <laughs> I had a shirt that that, go Root Rattlers. Um, and uh, and But what's also weird about it is it occurs farther south than um, than the northern lights typically do. And so recently, people were out observing Steve, just ordinary, like, you know, sky watchers. And they said, well, what is this? And they contacted, you know, like the appropriate atmospheric study groups. And they said, we don't know. This is kind of new. And they've been looking at it from the other side with satellites. So you can read about uh, Steve, the new Northern Lights-like phenomenon. Also, have an art, speaking of things that happen in the sky, a supernova may have prevented Earth from being a barren water world. Um, there, we've, As we've learned more about exoplanets and other star systems, a startlingly large number of them seem to be covered with water if they're a terrestrial planet like us that has a rocky core. Um, gas giants are their own thing. But if it's a terrestrial planet, it's much more likely to just be covered with water than we previously thought. And so that leads to the question, well, why are the planets that are rocky in our solar system not just covered with water? I mean, like Mercury, that is not covered with water. Venus is not covered with water. Earth has the most water, but even it's not covered. Uh, Mars, Mars is not covered with water. So, you know, uh, Pluto, which is a planet, is not covered with water. Um, neither is Ceres. You know, one of the one of the larger minor planets. So you got we have all these bodies that are the that are rocky but are not water covered. And so the proposal is that early on in our solar system's history, a nearby star may have gone supernova, which then caused uh the um the planets in our solar system to lose the water they otherwise would have had. It like blew that water out of our solar system. 
And it also may have left other traces that we can detect to support the idea that there was this supernova. And that may have then provided uh, some of the uh, some of the reasons why we got life on Earth, because if you have a water world, the there can be a barrier of ice between the surface water and the ground. But you need the ground and the surface water, the liquid water, to be in contact to get the chemical reactions you need going for life. So uh, so you can read all about that and how we may owe our existence not to just one supernova that created our solar system, but two. That's pretty cool. We'll, so we'll have the links to those as well. So we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible. This week, we're thanking Alvin W., Diane F., Christian E., and Michael B. Uh, through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows we do at sqpn.com. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think about the Russian woodpecker at the radar station Duga? Let us know. And in that, in the the uh, uh, Chernobyl theory, let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leave us some feedback there. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback, or just use the hashtag. We'll find it uh, either way. And remember to like this episode on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on Facebook. Retweet it on Twitter, uh, and please share it with as many people as you can. We we greatly appreciate that. Be sure to check out the Mysterious World Bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions. Uh, not just in this episode, but in other episodes as well. And you can find the, the links to all of the resources that Jimmy mentions and the links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thank you so much, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>